On behalf of CGD and ECDPM, welcome to our series of conversations on the European Financial Architecture for Development, in which we're exploring the discussions, the scenarios and the politics of the process to improve and rationalize the system of European development finance institutions. I'm Michaela Gavas, I'm the co-director of CGD's Europe Programme and Senior Policy Fellow, and I'm joined by my co-host, San Bilal. Hello, I'm San Bilal. I'm the head of uh, Trade, Investment and Finance Programme at uh, ECDPM. Happy to be here. So we're extremely pleased to have Katarina Matenova with us today. Uh, Katarina is the Deputy Director General for Neighbourhood Policy and Enlargement in the European Commission's DG NIR. Katarina, welcome and thank you for being part of this conversation. Thank you for having me. So Katarina, le let me start um, perhaps with a quote, uh, which I've taken from the Wise Persons Group report uh, of 2019. So that report stated, and I quote, while the European Commission plays a central role in the European system, the institution often lacks a single voice on development. It's rather complex structure of developing policy steer with many directorate generals involved does not facilitate policy coherence and efficiency. Do you agree with this statement? Well, I think that uh, the commission has a very specific setup. I think that uh, that comment is made by someone who looks at it, benchmarking the commission against uh, different type of institutions. For me, it is true that the uh, development uh, assistance and engagement is in two different directorates general, but they are divided by geography. In other words, the part of the commission, Digineer, where I work, uh, uh, deals with the countries around the EU, which means the countries that are in enlargement negotiations, which is the six Western Balkan countries and Turkey, and then what we call Eastern and sub Southern neighborhood, which is roughly um, Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Europe. So we deal with, uh, with the countries that are sort of for both geographically and politically uh, on the front line for the EU, uh, which makes them innately uh, more policy driven and, and, and political. And then uh, DG development, which is now called DG International Partnerships, uh, deals with the rest of the world. So yes, you have these two areas, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, subscribe to the notion that it's uh, much further uh, fragmented, uh, etc. Just like, you know, at the World Bank, you have different regions covering different parts of the world, geographically, uh, geographically uh, based. Thank you. So, so how would you, uh, if you like, rate your current relationship with DG International Partnerships? And, and what do you think could be improved in the way the two DGs uh, are currently working? Um, well, you're asking someone who, in fact, uh, spends a great deal of every week uh, working very closely with uh, DG INPA because uh, I'm in charge of uh, the International Fund for Sustainable Development, the EFSD, which is the new guarantee instrument. And that's an instrument that's been developed uh, together uh, with, uh, with then DG DEFCO, now DG, uh, DG INPA. So we are actually uh, the, the bit of uh, the two DGs there joined at the, at the hip, if you will. We had the joint secretariat in the, in the previous uh, uh, programming period. And now for the uh, one uh, that's starting this year, we are going to have a joint unit on, on risk management. So we are working very, very closely. Katahena, you had the chance so because of your geographical focus to, to work very closely uh, on, first on investments, uh, which is very important for, for, for the region uh, since a long time, but you have then the chance to work very closely with both the uh, EBRD and the EIB, which have been uh, in, in a sense in a beauty contest over these last two years to find out which, are, which one is the, is, is the best bank. 
what is your experience working with these two banks and how do you think uh, it could be improved? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I buy the notion that they've been uh, in a beauty context, uh, contest uh, for who is the best bank uh, because they're very different. They're they very, very different for, um, institutions. The wise person group report suggested to have one single European development bank. So that's what puts them uh, in, in this rivalry uh, situation. But perhaps my question is really, you know, what do you think is the strength and, you know, the advantages and how they could work better together? Um, well, I think that uh, the advantage of uh, the European investment bank is its uh, financial might. It's a public investment bank of the EU with a sizable uh, portfolio also in operations outside of the European Union. Uh, I think that there is a, a tremendous scope for uh, getting, and I think we can do better on that front, getting EIB involved where there is a need to mobilize large amounts of financing because they're hands down their access to, to uh, uh, resources at very concessional rates is paralleled, uh, paralleled uh, uh, by, by none. Um, EBRD is molded in a much more of a development uh, mode uh, with a very strong private sector focus. And so that's the area where we have been turning to them um uh, very reliably both on the both on the uh work on the private sector as well as on the on the policy um reforms that underpin the private sector development whether it's investment climate business environment corporate governance etc so i would i would say they they really have uh, a, a, a different their strength lie in different areas and that's why i think from the beginning i thought that choosing between them is the kind of selfish choice that's uh, not necessarily leading to the best outcome that i think the best outcome is ultimately what has been also agreed the status quo plus which means them working closer together you know having much broader mutual reliance uh having uh ebrd go into the private sector, into the smaller type of investments, et cetera, uh, whereas EIB uh, strength uh, should continue to be in the large ticket uh, items where you need to mobilize uh, large amounts of monies. So the latest council conclusions, um, they actually call for the commission to create incentives to strengthen cooperation among European development banks, financial institutions, and implementing actors. So how is DG Near preparing to answer to this call? Um, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, because of the, uh, you know, very uh, political nature of our engagements in our partner countries that are on the front line uh, of the of the neighborhood around the EU, uh, we have in fact been practicing a lot of what the council conclusions uh, are calling for over the last five years. Uh, we have uh, with the uh, under the previous uh, commissioner Commissioner Han, uh, we have established an enhanced collaboration with the IFIs where we in fact had uh, regular meetings and agreements on on upstream collaboration. We had a series of country days, uh, regional days where we, where we agreed on how to tackle challenges in, in different parts of, of our geographies. Uh, we in fact chose one of the areas that uh, uh, we collectively felt was underdeveloped and could use a joint push, which was energy efficiency in buildings. And I have led uh, joint missions to six of the countries in our geography um, where we would show up in ministers' offices, you know, the whole bus of the IFIs and, and, and led by the commission and, and got a number of uh, uh, policy changes as a result and coordinated uh, coordinated investment. So 
uh, I think that that a lot of that, in fact, inspi inspired uh, the uh, the resulting council conclusions. Because now I think the ambition is to do it more more of this on a, on a global scale. So I think that we are now uh, sort of institutionalizing on a, on a regular basis. But uh, but as I mentioned, over the five years we have over the last five years we have uh, started working much much closer with the with the IFIs and. Uh, especially not only on the investments, but also on the, on the policy engagement with our partner countries. Let me play a bit the devil advocate here. I mean, are, are you saying that the status quo plus is in fact, you know, uh, uh, just keeping the status quo doing what has been done well until now and, and just spreading the good practice or can we do something more? Then I mean, is I there think we can. I think quo, we right? can do something. I think we can do something more. But I do think we have, uh, uh, especially in our uh, uh, geographies, we have some practices that have worked, and that can be built on. The, for example, uh, the uh, Vice Persons Group report itself speaks of the Western Balkans Investment Framework as a model. And uh, I'm the chairperson of the of the Western Balkans Investment Framework, as well as the uh, Neighborhood Investment Facility Platform. And uh, there indeed uh, are things we have been doing and we have reformed the WBIF to, to become uh, a, a platform where the uh, partner countries, where donor countries, uh, IFIs, and under the leadership of the commission, in fact, exchange on the biggest challenges and chart out the, 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 the way ahead. And the WBIF will be the main uh, instrument for implementation and the NIP as well of, uh, of the investment economic investment plans that uh, DGNIR has now uh, put forward in, in all of its uh, uh, geographies. So, Sure, we can do better, and there is this is something that one still needs to needs to build on. But but I think the notion of uh, policy steer uh, early on, sort of upstream, and using the IFIs not only as investment vehicles or investment partners, but also as policy partners for policies that you pursue um, in, the, in the partner countries, uh, I think is, is, is something we need to build on. So do you think it's possible to have, I mean, um, you know, perhaps using the template of the Western Balkan investment framework to have such kind of North Africa investment framework and, 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 or, you know, other, and in other part of the world, similar kind of uh, things? What would be the lessons you would draw from, from the experience in the Western Balkans? Well, uh, one lesson is that you not only talk about uh, you not only talk about and support investments through the blending or guarantees, but very much uh, also uh, policy engagement in the partner countries. Another lesson from WBIF is that it's important to have the partner countries at the table to make them part of the conversation. So it's with them, not only about them. Uh, I realize that in some geographies, this may be more challenging than, uh, than in others. Uh, and, but, but, but it's really, it's really over time, there is a community that has built up around the WBIF that, uh, that pushes the, the economic reform agenda and the investments that underpin it uh, together in a, in a, in a fairly, you know, I would say fairly cohesive way by now. Um, can I can I just take you back to this issue of uh, policy steer? Um, so the the commission has been criticised for not giving enough of a policy steer, uh, for not actually setting the rules of the game or, or of engagement, and for not enforcing those rules. Um, now you you've said that 
you know, you as a DG near, you know, that's the, it's a, a key part uh, of what you've been doing, especially in the West, Western Balkans investment framework. I mean, what advice would you give to DG international partnerships to take on this role of policy steering? Um, well, look, I'm not, uh, I don't want to sound uh, uh, presumptuous of, of giving advice to colleagues in, in uh, DG, DG INPA. Uh, and, and, and again, let me just say that uh, due to the geographic proximity as well as cohesion in the, in the uh, parts of uh, uh, the near countries, it is easier for us to do because we in fact have cohesive uh, 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 groupings of countries, whether it's the Balkans, whether it's the Southern neighborhood, whether it's the, the, the Eastern uh, partnership, Eastern neighborhood. Uh, so it is, it is uh, uh, more doable than you have in more disparate parts of the world. But uh, what I would certainly there are two, two things that I would uh, uh, certainly recommend. One is to uh, engage early upstream, not discussing only investments, but also the, the, the policies and, and do it in a combination. And I think this has been really the game changer for us is that we created one conversation uh, in a specific geography between headquarter staff and our delegations together with the IFIs that, you know, their headquarters and their offices in the delegations. Because when, um, you know, if you, if you only leave uh, the discussion to be driven locally, then, uh, then you are missing sort of uh, sometimes the, the big picture and the drive from the, from the center. So, what we have been doing over the last uh, few years is, uh, is in fact uh, having these conversations together and, uh, and having, the, having the pandemic made it uh, even easier because now it's, uh, it's not strange to people to have a, a bunch of colleagues beamed on a screen. Um, but even in the pre-pandemic time, we always did it. Uh, you know, some people were able to to fly in to wherever the conversation was and, and others were joined virtually. And I think that's an important, that's an important element. And what is the experience then in that context with Team Europe? Because that's in fact, is, isn't it the spirit of Team Europe to have this discussion both at the national and regional level, but with multi, uh, multi actors. Uh, so far, the Commission is in this programming exercise. Uh, how, what is your? What are the early lessons you you draw from Team Europe experience? I think you should talk to the, about Team Europe to the Gene Pa more. Because uh, you're not involved I mean, in Team Europe, or no, we are, we are, but uh, but uh, 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 we see we see uh, 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 Team Europe uh, uh, practiced. As a as a as a as a matter of fact, it's a, it's a conversation both uh, both uh, in the in the partner countries with the with the various uh, delegations of uh, and embassies of the member states as well as uh, as well as uh, international financial institutions present, and uh, we also have sometimes the conversations, for example, on Ukraine uh even even with uh, headquarters uh, driven together with the delegation with the with the uh, uh home offices in the in the capitals of the of the member states so there is a variety of experiences that that we have had the one on 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 ukraine is something we've been doing for several years now i think for ever since maidan basically uh, where the support group for Ukraine has this conversation twice a year uh, and uh, where it intensely engages and even gives uh, um, various specific assignments to agencies of the, of the member states uh, to help in specific uh, reform areas. So Katerina, would you like to leave us with any final thoughts on um, this whole discussion and process around uh, the European financial architecture for development? 
Um, well, I think it was uh, an important process, an important exercise uh, with a fairly predictable outcome um, that we said from get-go, this is how it's going to land because that's what uh, institutional, uh, any, any institutional economist would say that every system has a very strong internal bias for uh, status quo. And, and I think that uh, what is important is now to fill the plus into the status quo collectively. And, and so I think that we have some ideas, but but this is not uh, this is not uh, all of it, and I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to to continue filling the filling the plus with good ideas and and uh, making making Europe uh, more more visible and impactful in its development cooperation. Thank you very much, Katarina. Thank, Thank you, you very much.